I am pleased to announce our next keynote, Anne Milgram. Anne has probably one of the most interesting applications of people analytics to reforming the criminal justice system, which she works on at the Arnold Foundation. As Anne discusses in her TED Talk, she took on the role of Attorney General in New Jersey and realized that her team was basically, as she said, making decisions using yellow post-it notes. Trying to answer some very fundamental questions about the organization, like who they were putting in jail and whether or not their decisions were making people safer, that, which seems fundamental to any criminal justice organization, led her down the path of data and analytics, which she continues today to employ to help better understand and fix criminal justice systems. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Ann Milgram. Within the past sort of five or so years, I think I've gone from being a lawyer and attorney to now being um, someone who I would consider to be uh, one of you, a data analytics nerd. Um, and I say that with love and affection. So in 2007, I was sworn in as the Attorney General of the state of New Jersey. That's a really unique job. The Attorney General of the state of New Jersey, which is just across the river from here, runs a 10,000 person department, the Juvenile Justice Commission, a division of criminal justice, the New Jersey State Police, and has full oversight over all the criminal prosecutors and all the police officers in the state. And by law is the chief law enforcement officer, meaning that you can make policy on law enforcement, on anything, policing, uh, prosecution, and that policy by law must be carried out statewide. So I came to this job having been a criminal prosecutor, starting in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and then going on to the United States Department of Justice. I prosecuted hundreds if not thousands of cases from where I started in the Manhattan DA's office with very low level crimes, what we used to call fair beats, um, token sucking. If you remember when in Manhattan they used to have the, the tokens that people would take out of the subways to really serious crimes like child sex slavery, robbery, domestic violence, um, and a lot of white collar fraud. When I became attorney general, the way that I see the criminal justice system switched completely. And over the course of the, sort of the past five or seven years, the way I see criminal justice has changed as well. So I came into the attorney general job having dealt case by case with specific situations. Someone committed a robbery, I looked at the law and the facts, and I prosecuted that case to the fullest extent that I could. When I became attorney general and I became responsible for statewide policy, I wanted to understand in a deeper, more fundamental way if we were making the right decisions. If we were making decisions that made us safer, if we were making decisions that used our resources more efficiently and effectively, and if we were doing what we were supposed to do in the criminal justice system, which is acting justly and fairly to all people who come in contact with the law. And so I asked, started asking a lot of questions. And I asked some of these big questions and I realized people looked at me with glazed eyes, right? It, most people have very busy day jobs, they're doing criminal work, and they don't have time to think about this. Then I started asking specific questions. What were we doing? What cases were we prosecuting? How many cases were we trying? Where were our teams deployed? We had hundreds of prosecutors. What kind of cases were they working on? We had hundreds of law enforcement officers. What were they doing? And at the time, I also oversaw the Camden Police Department right across the river because Camden was the most dangerous city in America and a former attorney general had superseded the police department. So I had a big job. I had a lot of questions. And unfortunately, I had almost no answers. From the point in time that I started asking these questions, people were stunned that I was asking for data and intelligence and information on what was actually happening. Everyone in this room knows, and I love to be in rooms like this, because everyone understands that you can't solve a problem you don't know that you have, right? And data isn't the answer to a problem, but data can tell you the why and the where and where you should look for opportunities to reform systems and bring change. So we started to look for what cases we were doing. Weeks later, and I've told this story before, but weeks later, I couldn't get any answers, and I went down to the Division of Criminal Justice to try to understand what was happening. And I found state investigators sitting in a room with manila folders going case by case through the files of the last year to try to tell me what cases we were prosecuting, how many cases we had prosecuted, and whether or not we were successful. About a week later, I was in Camden, New Jersey, again, the most dangerous city in America, with an unbelievable per capita murder rate that's higher than places like Honduras, right? And I was there, and I didn't see a single officer on the street. And then I went to a CompStat meeting, which is an analytics meeting, and everyone in this room is probably familiar with CompStat, and I'd been at the NYPD and seen their CompStat meetings, which, to be honest, I'm still terrified of, right? Like, they're really intense analytics meetings um, and accountability meetings. And I sat in the Camden Police Department, and it was the yellow stickies. We had a robbery last week, no suspect, and that sticky went on the wall. 
there was a homicide at this street corner, no suspects, and that went on the wall. Right? And as everyone in this room knows, yellow stickies are not a form of data management, of people management, of law enforcement management. Right? And by the way, I love yellow stickies, but again, they're, they're not the answer. So I went back and I started requiring and asking everyone to pull this data. And the end result is that we were able to change an enormous amount in a very short period of time by getting data and analytics in place. For the State Division of Criminal Justice, we found, not surprisingly, that essentially what we were doing were local buy and busts on the street corners of Trenton. We were essentially arresting low-level drug users, right? And we had statewide jurisdiction to do any type of crime. And our focus was violent crime, gangs, organized crime, public corruption. It wasn't low-level buy and bust on the street corner of Trenton. We were able to, to drastically transform that. Within a year, we went from 600 small arrests to 1,000 major cases um, in the areas I talked about. In Camden, within one year, we were able to reduce the murder rate by 40%. By 40%, simply by understanding what the officers were doing, where they were, where they were deployed, and what decisions they were making on a daily basis about which crimes to prioritize and how to do their jobs. So I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, because you guys are in businesses and in companies where you do this type of analytics all the time. But I do want you to understand something very fundamental, which is that New Jersey is not unique. I promise you that if any of you went home to your jurisdictions, be it Philly, be it a place across the country, you will find, if you start asking deeper questions about the criminal justice system, that most people cannot answer those questions. If you ask how many people are detained in your jurisdiction, what's the percentage of people who are released prior to trial? What's the crime rate of, or the rate of recidivism amongst the people who are released, right? Fundamental questions to understanding public safety, efficient use of public resources, and ultimately fairness. I say this to you because we're, we have a crisis in America. We have a criminal justice system that doesn't work, right? And I'm a huge part of that system, and I have been a part of that system for a long time. And I believe that ultimately data and analytics and technology will help us to reform the system in profound ways. But let me tell you a little bit about why I think the system doesn't work. And actually, let me start by saying, I think we all assume that it does. Right? And I did for years. In fact, I didn't just assume that it did. I sort of understood viscerally, I think, that it did because I was a part of it and I had facts and figures related to the criminal justice system. But I think we make the assumption for two reasons. The first is that we're a country that's built on this idea of liberty and justice for all. So we assume fundamental fairness in our organizations and our government institutions. The second is that most of you get your information on crime, where? From the media. Right? You get it from the TV news at night, which of course are the rapes, robberies, and murders. And you get it from TV shows as well. Right? So you get it from news and from TV shows. I am the legal consultant on Law and Order. I love it. I will tell you that I try so hard to make it accurate, but I promise you it's not always 100% there. Right? <laughs> there are times where I'll sit in the room, and I'll digress for one second, there are times where I'll sit in the room with the lead writers and I'll say, this would never happen. And they'll say, uh-huh, in 1985 in Mississippi, it happened. And so sometimes I have to back down. <laughs> but in America, what we assume to be the case that the criminal justice system works is not actually the, the case. We spend over $80 billion a year on corrections. You spend over $80 billion a year on corrections. Corrections costs are the third largest expense right now in states after health care and education. We incarcerate more people in the United States of America than any other country in the world. 40 years ago, we incarcerated about 200,000 people in prisons. Today, it's 1.5 million. And we have got about three quarters of a million people in jails. And I'll talk about the difference between jails and prisons in a minute. 50% of the people in the criminal justice system have severe or not treated mental illness. And if you put together the people who have mental illnesses with the people who have substance abuse disorders, that is 75% of our criminal justice system. And all of you sitting here think, okay, but we've got all these dangerous people out there, those people should be taken care of. I agree, right? But the reality is that the percentage of dangerous people is a lot smaller than all of us think. By FBI reports, 4.3% of all arrests are for violent crime, right? So about 95, 96% of all crime in the United States is nonviolent. When you look at jails, 75% or three quarters of the people who are in jails are in on low level offenses. They're in on property crimes, they're in on things like traffic, they're in on drug use, um, you know, simple drug possession, um, or on public disorder types of cases. And our recidivism rate, meaning the people who come back after we incarcerate them, is close to two-thirds. So we have a massive crisis right now. 
And the, the best statistic I can give you to make you really understand this is not the 2.3 million people in prisons and jails or the 80 billion. It's that, one in, it's, it's that 100 million Americans now have criminal records. That's one in three. So if you sit there and you think this doesn't affect me, and I don't know anybody who's been interacting with the criminal justice system, I promise you, you do. And that matters enormously because that 100 million people have enormous barriers to employment and to housing and to other fundamental things that people need to have opportunities to succeed and to ultimately not be a part of the criminal justice system. So I took my job at the Laura and John Arnold Foundation and I came into it having had this experience in New Jersey where I saw that data and analytics worked incredibly. Right, in Camden we built a very sophisticated ComStat system and we ran a lot of analytics to figure out where our officers should be deployed. In the State Division of Criminal Justice we did a lot of analysis as to where we were spending our time and how we could redirect those resources. So then I come to the Arnold Foundation and Laura and John Arnold are Texas billionaires, philanthropists, who put billions of dollars into a foundation dedicated to transformational change in the country. And their, their ask of me was, come back and tell us where the greatest opportunity is in the criminal justice system. So I sort of thought two things. One, changing the way people make decisions, right? Going from a system that is the same way now that it was 50 years ago, which is largely based on gut and instinct, right? And that's one of the fundamental flaws in the system is that forever we've thought, okay, we, we in instinctively know what's right and what's wrong and what the right answer is. And if you guys think for just a second what it means to be operating like, like the way the world was 50 years ago, it means most of us would have black and white TVs, right? All of our smartphones wouldn't exist, we'd have no DVR, and that's a lot of how the criminal justice system still works today. The second thing I thought about with the Arnolds was that nationally we spend a huge amount of time on the back end of the criminal justice system, meaning all of us agree that when people come out of prison, they're likely to reoffend. so we should try to help them have opportunities to get jobs and housing and so on. It's called reentry. And I agree and I support that very much, but my problem in this space is that we have too many people coming in the front end that if we don't make good decisions at the front end, we're gonna end up treating the problem at the back end. And anyone who has a kid or has a family members understands that when they're sick, you don't wait till they have pneumonia to take them to the hospital and they're treated for a really serious illness. You try to treat from day one, right? You try to treat the cold or the virus so that you don't end up in a situation where it's really bad and you're trying to work at the back end to change something that you could have changed earlier. So I wanted to focus on the front end of the system. Um, and I think we have some slides here. So, the front end of the system we spend $9 billion a year on. It's what I call pretrial. It's the point in time from when an officer arrests someone to the point that a DA charges or diverts or offers someone a plea to the point at which a judge decides whether that person should be released or detained prior to trial. And we started asking this question. Because we had no data in New Jersey, we wanted to understand what's the data nationally. Well, the short answer is that nobody had it. So we went out, we went nationally to th more than 300 jurisdictions and we started collecting data. And I'm only gonna spend about 10 seconds on this, but it was an unbelievable amount of work because jurisdictions right now don't measure the kind of things that we needed to know to understand what the system looks like. This is indicative of two major US jurisdictions in different geographic locations. But these are the numbers we've seen in every place we've run, they're very similar. This is essentially who's in our system. And when we talk about risk, we talk about if somebody gets released prior to trial, are they gonna commit another crime? And are they gonna come back to court? If we think you're gonna commit a crime or you're not gonna come back to court, we consider you to be high risk. If we think you're gonna show up, you're gonna be law abiding, we consider you to be low risk. And what you see is that more than half of the people in the criminal justice system are people who we consider low risk. About 40% are moderate risk, meaning that they pose some risk, but those risks can often be managed in a community through treatment or monitoring or supervision. And then there's the high risk folks who we talked a little bit about earlier. Those are the people I worry about from a public safety perspective. I think those people should be incarcerated or detained and should be aggressively prosecuted. And the question I would sort of say is, so that if I go out to jurisdictions, which I do all the time, and our work is now about to be announced in 30 other jurisdictions, so we're on the ground in a lot of places, and I ask the question, how do you make decisions up front? How do you make decisions, and I sit with judges all the time, how do you make decisions about who gets released, who gets detained, who's high risk, who's moderate risk, and who's low risk? All the judges say the same thing. I use my instinct, I use my gut, I use my intuition, I have a lot of experience, I know, um, right? And that's sort of the way that, that people have approached this. And I'll tell you what I do. Here's my principle, right, what all the judges say. I detain the high-risk people, the people who I think are a risk to public safety, and I release all the low-level offenders, right? And then, so what happens? These people don't have data. We pull the data, we run the data, and what do we see? 
we see dual system errors. And we see it every single place that we work in America. And that's twofold. One is that the dangerous people are getting out. In every jurisdiction we've looked at, half of the people who we identify as being the most high risk are being released. In one major US city, of the top 1% of the people who we identify as most likely to be violent, right? and our analytics team is very strong, we've got the best people in the country who've created all these types of tools and do machine learning and so on, the top 1% that we identify as being highly violent, potentially highly violent, half of those people in one major US city were released. That was about 300 people. That was over 100 violent crimes in the next year, right? So if we do our jobs, we can identify who those people are and we can prevent those violent crimes. On the flip side, huge proportions of the low risk people are being detained, right? And that's where we spend a lot of time thinking about it today. We spend time on both, but if you think again about the percentages that over half the people in the criminal justice system are low risk, if you detain a huge percentage of those people, you end up with the situation we're in today in America where we spend $80 billion a year on jail and corrections costs. We have three quarters of a million people at any given time in jails, 75% of which have committed low-level offenses, and most of whom, at least half, if not more, we consider to be low-risk people, right? And so we basically also did some research, and we wanted to understand, okay, so these are decisions we're making. Th these are our choices, right? And they may be choices we're making based on gut and instinct, but they're still choices. What impact does that have on people? And what we found was that when people are detained pre-trial for longer periods of time, they eventually commit more crime and it, the, for low and moderate risk offenders. And if you think about it, these are the people for whom they are loosely tethered to jobs, to housing, to family, right? And things like detention can have a huge impact on people's lives. So then we started thinking about, okay, what works, right? In New Jersey, I oversaw the Juvenile Detentions Alternatives Initiative Program, JDAI, and that was a program that was aimed at identifying which juveniles posed a serious risk to public safety and should be detained, and which didn't and could be safely released in the community. Through that program, we, rele we reduced juvenile detention in the state of New Jersey by 40%, from 1,000 kids, kids to 600 kids, and we simultaneously reduced juvenile crime. So the question was, why can't we do this on a bigger scale for adults in the system? And so that's what we've been doing, in large part, for the past couple of years. What we did was build a risk assessment tool. You see this slide that says 90% of jurisdictions don't use it. Well, the reason they don't use it is that the existing tools were incredibly cost costly. They were very manpower driven. They required extensive interviews of defendants. And they, the, the city of DC, which is a phenomenal pretrial system, costs over $60 million a year to run. Now, if I'd gone to the governor of the state of New Jersey and said, I have a great idea, I think I can reduce populations and be fairer, but I need $60 million, I would not have gotten very far. So we built this team, we got over 1.5 million cases, we now have over 4 million cases, and we've done the analytics so that the tool is nine factors, which all jurisdictions have, based mostly on criminal history and on the current offense that someone's committed, no interviews necessary, no additional staff necessary in most situations, really simple and easy to use. And the idea, again, being that we can help judges make better decisions with their instinct and their experience, but having analytics tools to basically look at them and to understand who the person is in front of them. So we've been statewide in Kentucky since 2012, I believe, uh, 2013 maybe, um, and we've got great results there. Populations are down, crime is down. We're in Charlotte, North Carolina. We're in Santa Cruz, California. We're in five counties in Arizona, and we're about to announce about 20 new jurisdictions, including a number of whole states and major U.S. cities. And the goal is within a year to make these analytic, this analytic tool available for free nationally. So I tell you all this, and, and I'm really proud of the data and analytics work that, that we're doing, but I tell you all this with a really deep understanding that we have not yet scratched the surface, right? The project I just described to you, it's like sometimes people come into my office and they say, well, that's great, isn't it common sense, right? And you guys probably feel this way in some of your jobs, and you probably do a lot more sophisticated data and analytics than I do. Um, but we're now having the conversation, and we convened a group of technologists and criminal justice experts and police chiefs this past week to start talking about how do we integrate this into criminal justice? How do we make better decisions? We can't live in a country where 100 million people have criminal records and where we're essentially using jails and prisons to detain people who have mental illness and drug addictions. Right? We have to live in a country where we do the best that we can in the criminal justice system to, to ensure public safety, to treat high-risk offenders the way that they need to be treated, to prioritize violent crime, but to also think about how we treat the rest of the people in the system. And without having the data and analytics, what happens is that everybody gets treated the same. 
right? It's a one-size-fits-all system where it's like there's one bucket instead of there being three or five or ten where there are different potential alternatives. And the reason I think data is so important in this space is, again, it's, it's what we talked about, which is that we can't solve a problem that we don't know we have. And the most important thing I see right now happening in criminal justice for the next five years is pulling the data, having people understand their situations, and then building analytics around it, and hopefully making a lot of that data open so that a lot of the smart people in this room and in other rooms can start working on it and building these types of tools. And I don't, I want to sort of end and take questions, but I want to end on a happier note because I realize that this talk is not that, is not that um, uplifting. My boss has recently formed a bipartisan coalition to work on criminal justice reform. That coalition includes the Koch brothers on the right, the ACLU on the left, Citizens for um, CAP, Citizens for American Progress, um, and a number of other organizations, both left and right. And they're starting a political movement to try to basically get people to think about how we can make the criminal justice system better. So while I think there are huge problems um, and reasons for great concern, I also have reason to be optimistic. Thank you very much. Yes, please. In baseball and poker, there's tons of online databases where you have sort of crowdsourced yep. analytics. Has anyone ever floated the idea of crowdsourcing analytics around the criminal justice system and making it open and de-identified, obviously? I don't know the legal implications, but. I love it. Um, so let me take a couple, more, let me get a couple more questions, but the short answer is I love that idea and we're thinking about it a lot, but let me, let me sort of get the next two questions and I'll answer them all at once. I really appreciate you reaching out to us. You know, I wouldn't know this um, without, <laughs> you know, you talking, uh, t telling us. Um, so my question is with the privatization of, you know, jail system and more and more corporate uh, private companies are running, I would imagine it might be good um, in, in terms of they are probably running the numbers and really trying to make things efficient, so they're probably good for data and analytics. I, it's an assumption. I don't know if you are, it's, it's right. But then I also see a lot of problems with the privatization. So where, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. And then second, it, may, it really makes me want to do something about it. I just wonder what like, people like me can do. Um, Thank you. Uh, I think the work on the pretrial side is fascinating. I have a question on the reentry side, yeah. which is, um, have you done or have you seen anybody extending those risk assessments into uh, corporations and organizations that are considering hiring ex-offenders? Because my sense right now is that a lot of organizations will see low-risk people as high-risk because they're already Completely. hitting that, that flag. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so, so first of all, you guys are all geniuses, and I love all these questions. Um, and, and I mean that sincerely, because you, you've really quickly narrowed in on the things that I think are important. The first question about, you know, sort of crowdsourcing data and using people nationally to work on the problem. The short answer is yes, and I would love to. It's a little complicated. We have now millions of cases. We hold the largest um, criminal justice data set on pretrial in America. Step back and think about that for a minute, because I run an initiative at a private philanthropy philanthropic foundation, um, and you should all be saying, why doesn't the United States government own this, right? And so there are already inherent questions about why this data isn't being collected by the people who have the greatest access to it. I would love to make our data public. We are under very strict agreements with all the people we have gotten data to, data from to date. We are starting to have conversations with our new jurisdictions about just this. What we also need to find, and so if anyone has thoughts, I would love to hear it, we need to find people who can help us anonymize the data. Because no local jurisdiction will have the time or the capacity, and I certainly, the way we get criminal justice data, I get social security numbers, I often get FBI numbers. As much as I'd like great data scientists in America to work on this, I need to be able to, to basically make it available in a way that doesn't that doesn't identify people by those factors. Um, but the short answer is I'd love to think more about it, and if anybody wants to help me think about it, I would love it. That goes a little bit to the um, how you can help. Anybody on the data, -lytic, data and analytics space who wants to help us, I would love it. Um, and I'd love to have conversations where I think there's opportunity. I also think just being aware of this and thinking about when people run for office and they say to you, put more people in jail, I want you guys to think really hard and really long about the way that we live in our country today and whether we're making the right decisions. And look, we've elected the people who have increased sentencing lengths, who've started a war on drugs where we incarcerate a lot of people with drug with drug addictions, and so we didn't do it intentionally. We, we're all responsible, but I think we are all responsible. Um, your other question, which I've now forgotten. 
privatizing jails and prisons. So this is a complicated question because there are competing, there are competing incentives in this space. What we've seen, and I don't work a ton in this space, but, but let me give you my sort of instinct on it. Um, the first thing I'd say is that I think that there's a great failure in not asking for data and analytics to be run. So I think even the best companies who might be running private private places, I'm not so sure that our leaders and the people who run our organizations are asking for the kind of data and analytics to be run that we all would think should be run. So it may be that the private companies have the capacity, but I'm not seeing that kind of sophisticated data and analytics were coming from there, and part of it may be that nobody's asking them. The second piece is that the incentives become really complicated. There's a conversation happening nationally now about private pro probation, which is when people are supervised as a part of a criminal sentence. And the conversation is that the, the longer people stay on probation, the more the companies get paid. So there's a built-in incentive for people to be on probation longer, and that's hugely problematic because a lot of people should be on probation for a period of time, have a certain amount of success, and then come off and not be on long term. So there's a lot of controversy around that. Um, and I think it's, you know, I don't know enough about the space to say, um, to really have a final answer other than to know that I think that the incentives are competing. And the last question, where's my friend on the last question? Reentry. Um, so, the question you ask about employment is something we talk about all the time, which is why can't somebody create an analytics tool or even give access to our analytics tool, right, which I would gladly do to corporations. Um, and we've started the conversation and it, we haven't gone very far with it yet, but, but to me, you're exactly right. The instinct is always to not hire people. Right, because you don't know enough and you're sort of, it's a gamble, right? And people are thinking, well, there's some risk. I've got one candidate who has no criminal record. I've got one candidate who has a criminal record and there's inherent risk sort of with the latter. I can tell you what we worked on reentry in New Jersey and we had big fanfare from a major New Jersey corporation that came in and said, we're, we're thrilled to hire ex-offenders. Please come to a meeting. I went to the meeting um, and it was hours long and it came out that they were willing to hire one person. At a company that was, I mean, thousands and thousands of people, a major US company. Um, and and I, I get that, you know, what we're talking about today, criminal justice, again, people see it in the media, people see it on TV, but without really understanding that most of the people who come into contact with the criminal justice system, 60 to 80% of all crime are misdemeanors, which are low level offenses, right? So what we think about, if you just watch TV, you would think it was all serious violent crime, right? Like my, my people at Law and Order, like you don't hear that dun dun, in the United States, there are a lot of low level offenders, like <laughs> some guy, some guy jumped a turnstile or sucked a token out of the, right? And, and we know why, that that's not a part of the, the sort of popular media, but it does really distort us to think that everyone, um, and think also about quality of life crimes and how many people have been arrested for drinking a beer on their front stoop, right? Or, or sort of like the, the, the way that community policing in some instances has played out. And you end up with a situation where, you know, if you knew and, and felt comfortable the guy was drinking a beer on his front stoop, you might actually hire him or if you knew that he was low risk. So I'm, I'm thrilled to have this conversation with any company who wants to have the conversation about using analytics um, in terms of hiring ex-offenders. Again, 100 million Americans is a lot of people, right, to be, to be, to be taking out of a job market. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, similar to the question about incentives on privatization, uh, one of the speakers yesterday talked about uh, sort of algorithmic displacement of cognitively sort of repetitive jobs in, over time. Um, when you encounter skepticism or resistance in local jurisdictions to what you're trying to do, to what degree is it, do, do you think it's resistance to change because it's a new process, or to what degree do you think it's resistance from the standpoint of putting people out of jobs? Yeah, so it's, a, it's also a great question. So a lot of times I liken it to computers and school rooms, right? That like, you know, you guys remember, and you may not remember because many of you look um, very young, um, but when computers were first going into classrooms, there was a lot of pushback, right? There was a lot of fear of what this would do to America. And so we go into some jurisdictions, and in one jurisdiction somebody said, I don't want this R2-D2 machine <laughs> showing his age, and I am a big Star Wars fan, um, but, but basically saying, I don't want this R2-D2 machine. And, and the thing about it is, um, we are unbelievably transparent. We use nine factors. Um, we use a statistical model. We have done significant amounts of machine learning, but we actually don't use a machine learning model in local jurisdictions, even though I think it has incredible analytic power. But if you can't see behind it, it's very tough to convince a government an official that they should rely on it. So we are as transparent as we possibly can be. We tell everyone involved in the system what the factors are. 
And then we say the following thing, which is ultimately the judges still get to decide. Ultimately, the DAs still get to decide. So what we are doing is providing them an aid to decision making. It's like they're making a decision right now, today, completely subjectively with no data and analytics, no information. We give them that information, and then they can put their judgment and experience on top of it. We still get resistance, and one of the way that we, ways that we overcome that resistance is by running the data. And if I showed you the modeling on the tool, you would see that in any jurisdiction, from between the way that judges make decisions today and the way that they would make decisions with the tool, it's usually about a 30% reduction in crime. Right? So if I sat there and I talked to you and I said, look, you think you're making great decisions, but I'm going to show you that the algorithm is actually doing 30% better in terms of public safety than you are, why not use it? Right? And what happens in a lot of places is that, remember, many judges are politically elected, um, and there's a lot of pressure not to let out the wrong person. And so what the tool is is an objective measure that gives judges more comfort. They may think someone's low risk, and then they have the objective data and intelligence that shows them this person is, in fact, low risk. Thank you so much.